Hi, welcome to another video. This is BMS Design Part 5. When I left you last, I believe I had three ADCs running. I was waiting for parts for the fourth cell. I previously blown an analog to digital converter up. Shortly I'll be talking about active cell balancing. But because I wanted a specific chip, Mauser had one. Not RS components here in the UK. So I ordered from Mauser. Their stock's in the USA. I ordered a couple of these ADCs, knowing I'd blown one up before, thought best to have a spare. Fitted this last night. So the actual ADC, analog to digital converter, is a SOT 235 pin little device in here. Fitted one, programmed it all, didn't work. Thought maybe I blew it up. Fitted the second one and it still didn't work. I then got my oscilloscope down, started programming the clock and data lines. I was getting data from the microcontroller, nothing from the ADC. You remember I went through the data sheet. The standard address is address 5. However, if you order from Mauser, they've got 6 or more of the 8 available addresses. Here's the Mauser package. So it's a microchip, 12-bit ADC, analog to digital converter. Don't know what half of this means. After reading the data sheet the other week, I noticed this part of the part number. So MCP3221, that's the generic part. A6 is the address. Mauser carry nearly all of the eight addresses. So you can run at least six of these on one microcontroller. You just have to order six different parts. I didn't know that RS components only stock one address. Mauser go the extra mile and order different addresses. So for ADCs, this left-hand one hasn't got the precision voltage reference. So this program's not complete yet. So we've got cell one, cell two, three and four. It now highlights the lowest cell and the cell with the highest voltage and gives us a total voltage of the battery pack. Then every 10 counts of each cell, it goes to a different screen and shows us power pack voltage and the average voltage. So remember, this is still sampling with reference to 5 volts. These have got precision voltage references, these three. I've designed and ordered some PCBs and they'll all have a precision voltage reference. So I'll measure cell 1 through to 4. So here is cell 1. 3.340 and as I said that hasn't got the precision voltage reference. So 3.338, 2 millivolts out. Cell 2. 3.374. And we have 3.373. Oh, there we go, 3.374. Oh, you can see it's fluctuating on the meter as well. So this is accurate to the millivolt today. <laughs> right, now to cell 3. Swap the leads. Cell 3. 3.341, 3.340. Oh, it's just 3.340. Remember, it's going round, checking them. So 3.341, 3.340, Right, the last cell. which I've been doing some work on with an active balancer, so the voltage is lower than it was previously. Here we go, this is cell 4. 3.543, 3.542, it's fluctuating between 1 and 2. See what this is fluctuating, 3.543, 3.542, I noticed, uh, oh there you go, 3.542 
and so we've got a total battery pack voltage of 13.59 so put this meter across all four ground live Thirteen point five nine. That's typical. Oh, there we go. It's fluctuating between thirteen point six. Oh, there we go. Five nine. And we've got five nine here. So accurate to the millivolt. Usually, this one will be improved when I get the PCBs. So this is just a quick update on the schematics. Those pull-ups for the ADC should go to the same supply as the ADC, not the 5 volt reference. I had a question last week about active cell balancing. So I purchased one of these. Linear Technologies 2.5 amp monolithic active cell balancer with telemetry interface. And here is the device from Mauser. So it's an LT8584. There's the basic circuit. So this chip controls an isolator transformer, only this coil tech one, here, it's just like a boost circuit. Instead of running one inductor, it's running this transformer with an isolated coil on the left and an isolated coil on the right. You can discharge any cell up to an average discharge current of 2.5 amps and either put the voltage back into the pack, supply your equipment measuring the voltage, or using relays or something, run it to a cell that's running low. Now 2.5 amps doesn't sound much, and they say you can parallel these devices up and get 20 or more running in parallel to get you a discharge current of 50 amps, which if it's in a car, you could take power from all the good cells and keep the lowest cell topped up just to stop that battery pack failing. That's the idea. So this chip has a power pad, hence my solder braid. I'll give you a closer look in a minute. My solder braid under the chip. Power pad, all grounds, switch, a couple of other pins that you can tie to live or ground. And my simple turn the discharge circuit on and off with this orange wire. Right, so further down the data sheet, page 13, so have a look, LT8584. Two methods of turning the discharge function on, active low, active high. So I went for this active low and wired my circuit this, like this. Here we go, I'll stop shaking it about. There's the chip, here's my ground. So this is just a breakout board and because it can carry two and a half amps I just used heavy wires from the pins until I get my PCB which already incorporates this with a power pad underneath. Here's some solder wick that I spread out to get thin and soldered it to the back of the chip. It's important not to allow this chip to overheat. Here's my wire, the orange wire just turns it on and off. I connected this green wire with a knot to the 3.3 volt cell. This was ground and this IC simply pulls current from the 3.3 volts through the transformer, switches it on and off quickly and then you get an output from the transformer. But the beauty with this is it works down to less than 3 volts. I think it's down to 2 point something volts. So as I mentioned, so you can either take this power, put it back into your device like this, that's measuring each cell, or with relays or something, focus it towards a low cell to stop the cells cutting out because one battery is low. But these are only capable of discharging 9 to 12 watts. Here's a look at the output. Shot key rectifier, in case you're not familiar, they're fast for the fast switching frequency. I'll put a 10 ohm resistor and I got 1.5 volts and the thing turned off. So I then strung a load of LEDs together. 1.8 volts, so you need 12 volts across here to get them to light up. And the 10 ohm resistor 
capacitor across the lot and this lit up. So I wanted to obviously draw more than 10 or 20 milliamps. Took these LEDs back out, put this wire back onto here with this capacitor, damped the wire on and smoke came out of this chip. It had been running for two minutes on this circuit and I couldn't wait to do the video. But by the time I finished messing about trying to increase the load, that's it, destroyed. So you, you can see there it says simple mode configuration. So I did this, but it blew up. Now, for the electronic experts, or if you're familiar with switch mode power supplies, you'll see there's actually something missing here. Maybe this chip doesn't need it. A, it hasn't got feedback because apparently this system measures the voltages on this primary. The load you put on the secondary dictates what this sees on the primary. So there's no secondary feedback required. That's the beauty about this. However, the downside is these are over seven pound plus VAT each. When all the electronic suppliers are restocked and things are back to normal, that's not gonna be till at least the end of next year, you could get one of these for about one pound 50 odd. That's a boost or buck converter, it runs on 3.3 volts, which is what you need for these cells. Get that similar transformer for three pound and you've got yourself an active discharge. However, no one in the world has got these. When I ordered this, Mauser only had 37 or 38 of these chips. They've now got one less because I've got one here. So back to this standard configuration, active low. There's another circuit. You can put sense resistors and it will measure the voltage on the cell and it will give you temperature out if you want to look at the serial data in and out. Transformer there. So before I scroll down further, Leakage inductance. Leakage inductance causes added voltage stress on the internal power NPN collector. Bipolar transistor not a FET. So the LT8584 uses an internal Zener clamp to absorb this leakage spike energy and clamp the switch node voltage to 50 volts. So that's quite important. There are so one per cell that's this, these transformers. This is only showing three cells, but you can have it on 100 cells. These are all feeding back to the whole battery pack. PCB layout, which I followed. No additional components here, look. Well, this is a switch here. So nothing on this pin here. Now, just for reference, Linear Technologies use this device, but they've actually got a battery management chip. It's the one I've been going on about many times, and that chip's about £22, and I believe they're not available. Could be wrong about that, but... So they've got one clever chip that controls these circuits. However, you can use them in a standalone mode, as I did, for two minutes. Here we are, down to page 32 of page 36. So in this circuit, so one cell, they've got two of these chips. Don't forget, over £7 each. Two chips. Transformers are about £3.50 each. So over £20 for these four parts, excluding all these passives. This chip is being controlled by their intelligent chip, the expensive one. It's controlling this as a master, so that's communicating. We've got a current sense here, look. But the important part on this circuit, even though I've just showed you, they're talking about surge protection within the chip. For the electronic enthusiasts, and those of you familiar with switchbone power supplies, look, so here's the transformer. The dot denotes the start of the winding. Here's a fast diode, capacitor, and a resistor. When this, it's, this switches on, pulls the 3.3 volts through this primary, when it releases, you get a spike, and that's, that spike could potentially damage the transistor that's in here. That's what they were talking about, the clamp. But yet yeah, we've got a snubber circuit here doing the same thing. The positive going spike through this diode, through the capacitor, back to the supply, and then this resistor discharges that capacitor. That resistor has got to match the size of the capacitor. You've got to discharge it to allow the next spike to shoot through 
and be absorbed through this capacitor. So that's the master with the snubber. Here's the slave. It's the same circuit again. They're quoting 1 to 4 transformers. I believe this one from Mauser is something like a 1 to 2 or 1 to 1.3 or something. It certainly increases the output. Oh, I had 13.2 volts. But notice this circuit here. So transformer. Oh look, doesn't go to the cell though. So we've got the switch, Zenodiode to protect everything. Sensible move. But look, it's coupled to a hundred microfarad capacitor here, and that's coupled to two parallel hundred microfarad capacitors. So at any one time, this can only discharge the energy here. It's not connected to the cell. So that's going to limit the amount of charge it can put through this transformer. And my circuit had nothing to limit the charge. So I probably killed it. All because I went to that first example circuit. But look at this more comprehensive one. It's nothing like that first circuit. And so that's over seven pound plus back down the drain. I can use this coil tech transformer for other stuff. I will experiment with other boost chips. So I was actually happy when this was running. It was running fine for a few minutes, but I thought just drawing like handful of milliamps is no good. I wanted to improve it, see how much current I could get out of it. But per unit, it's only something like nine to 12 watts per IC. So as I say, sadly this device didn't last more than two minutes. And I followed the instructions. It's back to the drawing board and I'll have to discharge the excess power, which is here. But that's only going to take minutes discharging that through a large ceramic resistor. Or as Jonathan said, I could use a FET in the ohmic region. So I've made lots of progress, got the four ADCs working, all calibrated. Just got to add a precision voltage reference to this, waiting for my PCBs. That's the basics of an active balancer. You've just got to decide where do you want to put the power. If you've got a car and each and one of the banks is about to give up out of the complete battery pack, then you would take loads of these, parallel them up and put their energy into the lowest pack or the lowest cell before the car stops. That's the idea of active balancing. Or for something like this, just take it and I'm using energy to look at this. So I could just use the energy to run this display and microcontroller, that sort of idea. So hopefully when all the electronic suppliers got all the parts back, we can pick and choose what parts we want for an active balance circuit. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two. If you liked it, don't forget to click like. I'll leave the C file as before on GitHub and put a link in the show more. If you want to donate a coffee for the C file or just for the details in this video, the link is also in the show more. Thanks for watching.